before we dive into the actual usage of Knative, let's see which components we got and how they interact with each other. We'll approach the subject by trying to figure out the flow of a request. It starts with the user. When we send a request, it goes to the external load balancer, which in our case forwards it to Istio Gateway accessible through a Kubernetes service created when we installed Istio. That is the same service that created the external load balancer if you are using GKE, EKS or AKS. In the case of Minikube and Docker Desktop, there is no external load balancer, so you should use your imagination, let's say. It could also be internal traffic, but for simplicity reasons, we will focus on users. The differences are trivial. From the external load balancer, requests are forwarded to the cluster and picked up by the Istio gateway. Its job is to forward requests to the destination service associated with our application. However, we do not yet have the app, so let's deploy something. We will simulate that this is a deployment of a serverless application to production. So we will start by creating a namespace. So please execute kubectl create namespace production. Since we are using Istio, we might just as well tell it to auto-inject Istio proxy sidecars or Envoy. That is not a requirement. We could just as well use Istio only for Knative internal purposes. But since we already have it, why not go all the way in and use it for our applications? As you already saw, when we installed Knative, all we have to do is add the Istio injection label to the namespace. So let's run kubectl label namespace production and the label is Istio injection equals enabled. Now comes the big moment. We are about to deploy our first application using Knative. To simplify the process, we will use KNCLI for that. Please visit the installing the Knative CLI documentation for the instructions on how to install it. And the link is in the resources or the comments section. Remember that if you're using Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL, you should follow the Linux instructions. In the simplest form, all we have to do is execute KN service create and provide info like the namespace, the container image, and the port of the process inside the container. So let's run KN service create. It will be called DevOps Toolkit. The namespace is production. The image is my own, which is vfr 6 slash DevOps Toolkit series. And the port is 8080. Now it will take a while until this is uh, executed, half a minute approximately, or more, or less, depending on your platform. Uh, anyway, I might fast forward to the end, just so that I don't bore you with uh, silly stuff. You might receive an error message similar to revision failed, revision, and then something failed with message, nodes not available, insufficient CPU or memory, or something like that. If you did, your cluster does not have enough capacity. If you have cluster autoscaler, that will correct itself soon. If you created a GKE or AKS cluster using my gist, you already have it. If you don't, you might need to increase the capacity by adding more nodes to the cluster or increasing the size of the existing nodes. Please rerun the previous command after increasing the capacity, either yourself or through cluster autoscaler. We can see that the Knative service is ready to serve and that, in my case at least, it is available through the subdomain DevOps Toolkit production. It is a combination of the name of the Knative service, DevOps Toolkit, the namespace, production, and the base domain, which in my case is IP with chip IO. If you ever forget which address was assigned to a service, we can retrieve it through the routes by executing kubectl namespace production get routes. Finally, let's see whether we can access the application through that URL. The commands will differ depending on whether you assigned chipio as the base domain or kept example.com. If it is chipio, we can open it in a browser. 
On the other hand, if the base domain is set to example.com, we will have to inject the URL as the header of a request. We can use curl for that. The alternative is to change your host file. If you do, you should be able to use open commands. If you are a Linux or a WSL user, I will assume that you created the alias open and set it to xdg open command. If that's not the case, you will find instructions on how to do that in the setting up a local development environment section. If you do not have the open command or the alias, you should replace open with echo and copy and paste the output into your favorite browser. So if you're using Minikube, Docker Desktop and EKS, your command would be curl-h and then the host devopstoolkit.production.example.com followed with the, the address, the host, right? I'm not going to execute that. I will show you the, com the open command that works in GKE. Uh, if GKE or AKS is not your platform, you will find the equivalent command, the CURL command in the comments or the resources section. Now, for if you are indeed using GK or AKS, then instead of curl, we are going to use open, and that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to open HTTP devops toolkitproduction whatever is the value of my ingress host. If you used curl or CURL, you should see the HTML of the application is the output in your terminal. On the other hand, if you executed open, the home screen of the web app we just deployed should have opened in your default browser. How did that happen? How did we manage to have a fully operational application through a single command? Is that what you're asking? I hope you are. We know that any application running in Kubernetes needs quite a few types of resources. Since this is a stateless application, there should be, as a minimum, a deployment, which creates a replica set, which creates pods. We also need horizontal pod autoscaler to ensure that the correct number of replicas is running. We need a service through which other processes can access our applications. Finally, if an application should be accessible from outside the cluster, we would need an ingress configured to use a specific domain or a subdomain and associated with the service. We might, and often do, need even more than those resources. Yet, all we did was execute a single KN command with a few arguments. The only explanation could be that the command created all those resources. We will explore them later. For now, trust me when I say that a deployment, a service, and the pod autoscaler was created. On top of that, the ingress gateway we already commented on was reconfigured to forward all requests coming from a specific subdomain to our application. It also created a few other resources like a route, a configuration, an Istio virtual service, and others to make things even more complicated. Finally, and potentially most importantly, it enveloped all those resources in a revision. Each new version of our app would create a new revision with all those resources. That way, Knative can employ rolling updates, rollbacks, separate which requests go to which version, and so on and so forth. Creating all the resources we usually need to run an application in Kubernetes is already a considerable advantage. We removed the clutter and were able to focus only on the things that matter. All we specified was the image, the namespace, and the port. In a real-world situation, we would likely specify more. Still, the fact is that Knative allows us to skip defining things that Kubernetes needs and focus on what differentiates one application from another. We will explore that aspect of Knative in a bit more detail later. For now, I hope you already saw that simplicity is one of the enormous advantages of Knative, even without diving into the part that makes our applications serverless. Now that sufficient time passed, we might want to take a look at the pods running in the production namespace. So let's execute kubectl dash dash namespace production and then get pods. Now, in my case, the output states that no resources were found in production namespace. 
if in your case there is still a pod, you are indeed a fast person and you did not give Knative sufficient time, wait for a few moments and rerun the previous command. So what happened is that Knative detected that no one was using our application for a while and decided that it is pointless to keep it running. That would be a massive waste of resources of, let's say, memory and CPU. As a result, it scaled the app to zero replicas. Typically, that would mean that our users, when they decide to continue interacting with the application, would start receiving 500 responses. That's what would usually happen when none of the replicas are running. But, as you can probably guess, there is much more to it than scaling to zero replicas and letting our users have a horrible experience. Knative is a solution for serverless workloads. And as such, it not only scales our application, but it also queues the requests when there are no replicas to handle incoming requests. Let's confirm that. As before, the commands will differ depending on whether you're using Minikube Docker Desktop or EKS, or on the other hand, GK and EKS. For the former, uh, Minikube Docker and EKS, you should execute the CURL curl command that is in the gist. And I'm using GK. Uh, if you're using GK yourself or EKS, the command, you can open it with the open command. And in my case, it will be the latter. So I will execute open HTTP DevOps Toolkit dot production dot whatever is the value of my ingress host. As you can see, the application is available. From the user's perspective, it says if it was never scaled to zero replicas. When we sent the request, it was forwarded to the ingress gateway. But since none of the replicas were available, instead of forwarding it to the associated service, it sent it to Knative Activator. It, in turn, instructed the autoscaler to increase the number of replicas of the deployment. As you probably already know, the deployment modified the replica set, which in turn created the missing pod. Once the pod was operational, it forwarded the queued request to the service, and we got the response. The autoscaler knew what to do because it was configured by the pod scaler created when we deployed the application. In our case, only one pod was created since the amount of traffic was very low. If the traffic increased, it could have been scaled to two or three or any number of replicas. The exact amount depends on the volume of concurrent requests. Thank you so much for watching. Click the thumbs up button if you liked it. Subscribe if you would like to receive notifications when new videos are posted. The video you just watched was taken from the DevOps Toolkit Catalog Patterns and Blueprints. It is a course on Udemy and a book currently available from Limpub. Please check it out. If you do, bear in mind that this is work in progress. You will receive new sections as soon as I create additional ones. You might also want to check out other courses and books or the DevOps Paradox podcast I am hosting with Darin. Your support is very, very welcome and useful. The links are in the description together with promotion codes and discounts.